I'll try to preach briefly today because for today of all days when we read this story about the disciples falling asleep, I don't want your eyelids to get too heavy. So we'll turn up the lights and hopefully we'll all stay awake here for this short time together. We're going through this sermon series on keeping time, how Jesus passed his last day, the final 24 hours in his life here on earth We're reading these stories that we often read on Palm Sunday all together, these 14 and 15, 15th chapters of Mark, so that we get a little bit more time to spend with these stories. Isn't it funny how time is relative? I don't know if you've ever heard a wonderful preacher at a festival or a revival or something like that preach for an hour or an hour and 15, an hour and 20 minutes. And it just feels like it went by just like that. They're just engaging and they keep your attention. And then other times when someone speaks for three or four minutes and it feels like an eternity, they're just kind of droning on, repeating. We've all had that experience where time doesn't seem to pass as it should. We read in scripture, a thousand days are just a moment in God's sight. One of the times when I've experienced, and maybe you've experienced too, time passing very strangely is when I've been waiting in a hospital waiting room, waiting for a loved one to come out of surgery. For you and the person sitting waiting with you, it feels like time just creeps by. Every time you look up, it seems like the clock hasn't moved as much as it should. But for the person who's under anesthesia, it's just a flash of an eye, just a blink. I remember one specific time when I was down in Charlottesville at UVA for my father's surgery. My father had colon cancer, and this was his, his second bout of it. He had already been through one round of surgeries, one round of chemo, and then we found that it was back again. My mother and I waited in the waiting room. It was supposed to be a three, three and a half hour surgery. Three hours came, four, four and a half. We got little updates from the surgeon saying, it's okay, everything's fine, but no real news. Five hours, six. Finally, in the later hours of the afternoon, we sat down and met with the surgeon. And they came in and they have a small waiting room inside the waiting room where you go and you talk with the surgeon. And he said, well, as, as you can imagine, things didn't go as well as we had hoped. The cancer wasn't just, the tumor wasn't just in the colon, but it was through the wall of the colon into bone. And we had to remove the bottom three bones of his sacrum. It's going to be a longer recovery than what you expected. It's going to be a little bit more than what you thought, but we do think we got it all. We'll still need to do chemo and radiation, but you can see him soon. And we went into the hospital room an hour later or so, and I sat there holding my dad's hand, me on one side and my mother on the other, waiting to hear how things had gone. Other siblings gathered around, and we finally saw my dad open his eyes. And he looked at all of us, especially his wife of 30 years sitting there, and he opened his eyes and said, prayers answered. And I wanted to just throttle him (laughs) and say, I don't know whose prayers you thought are answered, (laughs) but this was not what I was praying for. I was praying for the surgeon to come in and say, everything's easy, everything's great, the recovery's going to go fine. And that was not the answer that I got. But ultimately, my dad, as, as is true in many areas of faith in our life, my dad was right. He opened his eyes, and as often is said in the African-American tradition, thank you, God, for waking me up this day. Thank you, God, for bringing my eyes open, for giving me one more day of life. My father's prayers were answered. Sometimes when we face life's challenges, whether it's in the surgical room 
or whether it's in the daily stresses of life, or whether it's in mental health issues or addictions, sometimes prayer comes slowly. Sometimes it seems unanswered. But here we learn from Jesus what prayer truly is. But prayer doesn't always mean that the cup is taken away from us. Sometimes it means that even though we suffer, God is with us. Jesus, as it's described in the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Mark, was a man of prayer. Jesus was a man for whom prayer came very easily. But if that's not the case for you, you're in good company. Here we hear this is the only place in Mark where the disciples are talked about praying, and they do a very bad job of it. They fall asleep again and again, even when Jesus is right there nagging them almost to stay awake. But here, even in their failings, Jesus teaches them what it means to pray. We hear in a hymn called Go to Dark Gethsemane that we sang earlier in the first service, we hear, Go to dark Gethsemane, all who feel the tempter's power. Your Redeemer's conflict see, watch with him one bitter hour. Turn not from his griefs away. Learn from Jesus Christ to pray. Jesus provides a model here of how, even in suffering and sorrow, to pour our hearts out to God. Prayer changes us. It prepares us. And ultimately, it flings us back out into the world. Not to do as we would will, but to do as God would will us to do. Have you noticed that thoughts and prayers are getting a bit of a bad rap right now? Maybe you've seen on Facebook or or in the news people condemning thoughts and prayers, especially when it comes to this, this issue that we're having around mass shootings and gun violence, especially when it surrounds this terrible tragedy that has happened in Florida. Politicians seem to use this, this phrase emptily, perhaps, we don't know what's, what's in their, their hearts, but I know that someone on, on Facebook posted, when you say you're praying for someone, do you really do it? I think it's a good question for us all to be asked when we say that we're praying for someone, whether they're on our prayer list or whether they've asked you to pray or whether you just volunteer it, do we really do it? It's a hard challenge to face. But prayer, true prayer, brings us back into relationship with Christ. And it does change us. I kind of take issue with this this taking issue of, of thoughts and prayers because I believe that prayer is powerful, that prayer really does do something. There's a hymn that someone someone just recently wrote just this last week, Carolyn Winfrey Gillette wrote this hymn that goes, If we just talk of thoughts and prayers and don't live out a faith that dares and don't take on the ways of death, our thoughts and prayers are fleeting breath. If we just sing of doing good and don't walk through our neighborhood to learn its hope, to ease its pain, our talk of good is simply vain. God, may our prayers and dreams and songs lead to a faith that takes on wrongs, that works for peace and justice too, then will our prayers bring joy to you? No matter where we are on the political spectrum, we can agree that Christians are people who are called to live out justice in the world. That violence is never God's desire. God weeps with those who weep. God mourns with those who mourn. And we are called to do the same. To cry with the parents who have lost their children, with students who have lost their colleagues, 
those who sat next to them in their desks. We, like the disciples, will fall asleep on the job. We will not know necessarily which way to go always. But prayer does make a difference. Prayer changes us. Prayer sends us out into the world to act in a different way. As we contemplate Christ's compassion and suffering for us on the cross, we are reminded that God has already gone before us, that Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane has wept for us and has borne all that we can ever bear in this world in his body. Our prayers are already answered. Thanks be to God. Amen.